This is Qatar. It's a really small country with the same size as the state of Connecticut and the country of Jamaica. Qatar has some 300,000 citizens, which is fewer people than live in Iceland. In 1939, oil was discovered here in the Dukhan field. And in 1971, natural gas was discovered here in the North Dome in Qatar's territorial waters. These oil and gas discoveries turned the miniature country Qatar into one of the richest countries in the world. And Qatar has invested a lot of the money from its oil and gas in different assets around the globe. For example, Qatar has bought the famous French football club PSG. It owns Harrods in London, it owns 10% of the Empire State Building, and it owns 17% of the voting rights in Volkswagen, the world's second largest car company. But Qatar has not invested only in tangible assets, like shares and real estate. It has also invested heavily in intangible assets. For example, Qatar made history when it paid 30 million euro per year to become the first paying advertiser on FC Barcelona's legendary club jerseys. And now Qatar is again making history when it's spending an estimated 220 billion dollars to arrange the world's largest sporting event, the FIFA World Cup. I have to be honest, it's not until recently that I've grasped how utterly ridiculous it is that the FIFA World Cup will be hosted by Qatar. And the more I learn about this World Cup, the worse it gets. So what I want to do in this video is that I want to summarize the six main reasons why it's ridiculous to let Qatar host the World Cup. So what you see right over here is the Swedish Royal Palace. This is where the Swedish king works. So yeah, Sweden is a hereditary monarchy and that is a bit embarrassing, I know, but at least Sweden is a constitutional monarchy, meaning that our king doesn't have any formal decision-making powers. Qatar, on the other hand, is a semi-absolute monarchy, meaning that the country is actually run by the hereditary emir Tamim bin Mohammed Al Taini. Tamim holds all executive and legislative authority, and he doesn't need to stand for proper elections. Ever since taking office, Qatar's emir Tamim has had ambitious plans for Qatar. His goal is to transform Qatar from a small oil and gas supplier to a Middle Eastern powerhouse. He wants Western politicians to listen to Qatar, he wants Western companies to invest in Qatar, and he wants Western tourists to visit Qatar. But Tamim has realized that it's difficult to gain respect in the West when 1. You don't have democratic elections. Two, women are oppressed and have to have male guardians, while men are allowed to have several wives. Three, there is no freedom of expression, and migrant workers who publicly criticize Qatar can and do get arrested, fined, and deported. Four, when same-sex conduct is a criminal offense. Qatar has realized that things like these are important in the West. But Qatar has also realized that there are other things that are almost as important in the West. For instance, football. So instead of reforming Qatar's political and social system, which is hard and could threaten Hamim's power, Qatar is now using sports to fool the West into respecting Qatar. And that's what we call sports washing, when dubious regimes or corporations use sports to wash away bad reputations. And by allowing Qatar to arrange the world's largest sport event, the FIFA World Cup, we're giving Qatar the best possible sports washing opportunity. And unfortunately, it will work. And speaking about that, how come we're allowing Qatar to arrange the World Cup? So this FIFA report from 2010 is really interesting. So in 2010, FIFA left its headquarters in Switzerland to travel to the USA, to Australia, to Japan, to South Korea and to Qatar. All of these countries had applied to host the 2022 World Cup and FIFA had to go and evaluate each candidate. After these evaluation trips, FIFA published this evaluation report that harshly criticized only one of the candidate countries, Qatar. But this criticism didn't deter Qatar. Instead, Qatar doubled down on its candidacy and launched a $200 million campaign 
to compare, Australia spent $43 million on their campaign and the USA only $5 million on its campaign for the 2022 World Cup. Qatar's $200 million campaign, plus huge deals with influencers like David Beckham, plus shady deals involving the French president Sarkozy and the purchase of PSG, Qatar secured the votes needed within FIFA to get the 2022 World Cup. And you just have to look at FIFA's own evaluation report to see that Qatar was the least suitable candidate to host the 2022 World Cup. That Qatar, despite that, was awarded the responsibility of hosting the World Cup shows that to host the World Cup in football, you first have to win the World Cup of corruption. Qatar, with its 300,000 citizens, has no football tradition whatsoever. In 2010, the year FIFA decided that Qatar should host the World Cup, Qatar's national football team was ranked number 113 in the world. This is hardly a nation that wants or needs a World Cup. The World Cup has always been held in June and July, during the off-season of most of the European football leagues. But in June and July, the average temperature happens to exceed 40 degrees centigrade or 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Qatar. So to accommodate Qatar, the whole tournament had to be moved to November and December. Since Qatar has only around 300,000 citizens and no football tradition whatsoever, it's not that strange that Qatar had none of the infrastructure in place that is required to host a World Cup tournament. So Qatar had to build all of this infrastructure in the middle of the desert in just over 10 years, including eight completely new World Cup level arenas. And it's not Qatar's own 300,000 citizens who've built most of this infrastructure, but instead around 2 million workers from countries such as India, Nepal, Kenya, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and the Philippines, many of whom are working under what Amnesty describes as abusive conditions. The money that Qatar has had to spend to overcome all of the obstacles associated with hosting a World Cup in the middle of the desert is simply staggering. It has over time become increasingly expensive to host the World Cup also in other places of the world and the World Cup in Brazil was the most expensive so far, costing an estimated 15 billion. But Qatar's expenses for the 2022 Cup simply takes things to another level with an estimated cost of 220 billion. So like many others, I have strong feelings for the World Cup and I have many strong World Cup memories. For example, I will always remember how gutted I was when Sweden lost to Senegal on a golden goal in the 2002 playoffs. And I will always remember how surreal it felt to see Germany beat Brazil 7-1 in 2014. So football and the World Cup is important to me and it's important to millions, maybe billions of people around the world. What's so extremely sad is that shady and anachronistic regimes like Qatar is allowed to abuse this passion for football for their own cynical purposes. And I know that this is nothing new. Russia organizing the World Cup four years ago served similar cynical purposes, but for the reasons I've discussed in this video, letting Qatar host the World Cup just take this cynicism to a completely new and a bit of an absurd level. So what should we do? Should we boycott the World Cup to show regimes like Qatar that we aren't as easily fooled as they think? To show that our democratic values and human rights and women's rights, etc. are more important to us than football? I actually don't know. What do you think? Thank you very much for watching this video and since you watched this far, Maybe you liked the video. If you did, you can help me make more videos like this by becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash themarketexits. And to my existing Patreons, thank you so much for supporting my channel. It means everything to me. If you can read Swedish and want to know more about the Qatar World Cup, I can recommend a fantastic little book called Templet i Öknen, written by Sweden's best sports journalist, Olof Lund. That was it for this video. I hope that I will see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.